Jakarta was built on swampy land abutting the Java Sea with 13 rivers running into it. For hundreds of years flooding has been one of Jakarta's biggest problems. Flooding is is a frequent occurrence in Jakarta. Um, and it's getting worse. When the Dutch colonised Indonesia in 1619, they began transforming Batavia, which is now called Jakarta, to make it like a typical Dutch town with modern buildings and canals. These canals were meant to regulate the flow and to control the flooding. Uh, but maybe they exacerbated the underlying problems. You see, the alluvial soil of the delta naturally compacts over time, causing the land surface to subside, unless it's continually replenished with new sediment from overflowing rivers, uh, which the canals themselves tended to prevent. As a result of groundwater extraction and unregulated development, <coughs> Chikata is sinking by average, 1 to 15 centimetres a year and almost half of the city is now below sea level. Indeed the Jakarta conurbation is the second largest in the world with a population of around 32 million and it's ranked at number 12 for skyscrapers and has the greatest number of shopping malls. These te miles tend to rely on groundwater extraction and maps indicate that the sinking is greatest around them. Historically, North Jakarta, or Kota as it's known, has historically been a port city and even today it houses one of Indonesia's busiest seaports, Tanjung Priok. Its strategic location, where the Chiliwong River runs into the Java Sea, was one of the reasons why Dutch colonists chose to make it their hub for the East Indies in the 17th century. Today, 1.8 million living people live in North Jakarta, and it's an interesting mix of fading port businesses, poor coastal communities, and Chinese Indonesians, some of whom can be very wealthy. North Jakarta has sunk point by 2.5 metres in the last 10 years and is continuing to sink as by as much as 25 centimetres a year in some parts. A model suggests that by 2050 about 95% of North Jakarta will be submerged. An ambitious plan was developed for a great Garuda, a 32-kilometre outer sea wall across Jakarta Bay, along with 17 artificial islands, which would rescue the sinking city at a cost of about 40 billion, possibly as much as 58 billion. It would include a 20-mile-long artificial island in the shape of a Garuda bird. Uh, the 100,000 acre islands would block storm surges uh, but it was also supposed to house offices and apartments, a huge reservoir, highways and a train track as well as recreational facilities. It was supported by the Dutch and South Korean governments by 18 million dollars and creating an artificial lagoon into which waters could be lowered to allow the city's rivers to drain. It would purportedly help with the flooding during the rainy season, season. Uh, but without addressing groundwater extraction and unplanned development, uh, such an investment would only buy Jakarta time, maybe just 20 years, not resolve its issues. Indeed, there's a need to replace the extracted groundwater to stabilise the city, at a cost far greater than that of the Great Garuda. Jakarta would also need to clean up its water sources to provide alternative water sources and develop a public water infrastructure. Not least as 64% of the groundwater reserves are already depleted. Given the unregulated development, there's limited free space, including on the floodplains and riverbanks, to replenish the groundwater. 
Furthermore, the lagoon would effectively block the rivers, meaning that they would discharge into the lagoon, creating a massive cesspool. Uh, the Indonesian government's response to these seemingly insurmountable problems is to construct a new capital city, Nusantara, in Kalimantan or Borneo, planned to be completed by 2045. Promoted as a global city for all, a smart green city that acts, acts as a hub for industry, business and education. The 35 billion projected cost is financed by the national budget, state-owned enterprises and private, interna uh, private investors, with a number of overseas investors expressing interest. The land reclamation project was initially part of the National Capital Integrated Coastal Development Plan, known as the Great Garuda, <coughs> which aims to build a sea wall to keep the water out of the city, but also to help slow subsidence. However, the land reclamation project was taken over by the Jakarta City Administration, who believed that the land reclamation itself would not help the subsistence, uh, subsidence problem. The presence of artificial islands will change sea currents, which can lead to the erosion of nearby natural islands, or even more flooding of the city. Fishermen protested, saying that the project will affect their catch, and they will have to go further out to sea, increasing their gasoline expenses. As always in Indonesia, the reclamation of the islands has been subject to controversy, political chicanery and accusations of corruption. Uh, Pantai in the Kapuk, or Pik, uh, as it's known, because of Indonesians love to shorten every name, was historically part of the particular landrich or private domain of Kapoyek, Kapoyk, uh, the estate was owned by Tan Engoan, the first mayor de, mayor de China, China, Chinzen of Batavia, 1802 to 1872. In 1988, the property developer Chiputra, backed by Indonesia's wealthiest man at the time, Sudono Salim, acquired the area and developed today's housing estate of Pantai in the Kap Kapuk, earmarked as a wealthy suburb of gated communities. Now, Pick was criticised for its potentially negative environmental impact and incompatibility with existing regulations. It was built in 1989 on a form an area formerly covered by mangrove forests and swamps which would have been the best solution to Jakarta's prob uh, flooding problem. According to the city's master plan, land use for uh, 1985 and 2005, the location was still designated a green belt area, uh, but this was changed into a residential area in 1995. A uh, pick is divided into two areas, namely uh, Pantai Inda Kapok 1, consisting of the mainland, and two reclaimed islands with the name Gulf Island and Ebony Island, and Pantai Inda Kapuk too. And mostly housing, Pick also has shops on main streets such as Jalan North Beautiful Beach, Jalan South Beautiful Beach, and Jalan Beautiful Marina. The Cordoba and Crown Golf on Jalan Marina Inda is known for its restaurants and cafes. Pick can be accessed from the toll roads. Uh, Professor Dr. Sedamioto, uh, the West Jakarta Outer Ring, Ring Toll Road, as well as from Pluit and Mura Karang. But certainly on the day I visited, which in all fairness was possibly the busiest day in the year, it was just one long traffic jam similar to central Jakarta. Uh, Pick is often the most sought after residential area for wealthy Chinese Indonesians, featuring large mansions in exclusive gated clusters. 
The area never floods despite being in close proximity with the flood prone districts. One of the legacies of colonialism is that Indonesians, and particularly the rich and powerful, are very thin-skinned. Any foreigner voicing even the most minor criticism on the country's post-colonial development is labelled as, as an imperialist and derided. Now this is not unique to Indonesia, but a situation that I must navigate on, on a daily basis. That some islands have already been developed in Jakarta Bay is indeed an accolade, especially when you compare it to the stalled developments in Dubai, such as the World Project. Nevertheless, when I visited PIC, I was concerned that despite being marketed as luxury development and sold at a premium, so much seems to be cheaply constructed. Essentially, a lot of development is of concrete boxes augmented with rather frivolous decoration. I was taken there by my eldest daughter and her boyfriend, who were rightly proud of Indonesia's achievement. It was shaped by us deciding to visit on probably the busiest day of the year, and the traffic was simply impossible. Like Jakarta itself, nothing like enough planning has gone into traffic management and public transport. We were forced to do a huge tour of the entire development by car, with security guards blocking sections where we might have turned around or back. Uh, because of this, there were many areas we could not visit, and I have to rely on photos that I've been able to download, rather than actual footage I, I shot. But I was struck by the rather cheaply constructed estates of homes in gated communities, Unlike main, uh, mainland Jakarta, it was very clean. Nevertheless, I'm always concerned when I see gated communities and what these are telling us about social relations within the city. I was also concerned about the large number of apartment blocks, some of them high-rise, Whilst high-rise apartment blocks do dominate the Jakarta skyline, I was not expecting to see these on the new development. Uh, this is especially true along the reclaimed beach areas, making it a little reminiscent of Florida. One example of this frivolous decoration is the area known as Amsterdam where faux elements create a superficially Dutch style. But it was very superficial, and I don't know who would be the most insulted, the Dutch, or buyers paying a premium for these decorative elements. Now, I've seen footage of similar developments in China, which many of which have been abandoned. I cannot decide if these developments in China seem more authentic, to that which they mimic is a good or a bad thing. But I cannot help but feel that a little more thought and attention should have been put into the whole project. I guess the feeling is mixed with the substantial, that substantial authentically Dutch areas of North Jakarta have been left to crumble. Yes, Kota Tua is now being preserved, uh, but all around it are Dutch buildings that have not only been left to rot, uh, but are normally seen as a part of the shame of Indonesia's colonialist past. Unlike Jakarta itself, a degree of zoning was much in evidence. Uh, but this was 
zoning completely dependent on car ownership. So they're currently somewhat isolated leisure and shopping centres. Maybe these will feel a little less isolated as the area develops, but somehow I doubt it. Some of these newer developments have a Disney-esque quality to them and appear to be very popular, so maybe I should hold off with my criticism. Given the predominance of Chinese residents, it's probably no surprise that those areas containing Chinese restaurants and shops were perhaps the most impressive. Certainly at night time, the faux Chinese decoration was visually pleasing and similar to Chinatowns the world over. I recall being taken to nearby Pluit by a Chinese Indonesian friend many years ago and being impressed. I would not realised that Pluit really forms uh, part of this major new city being built in Jakarta. And maybe as I age I'm becoming more cynical and for this I must apologise. As a child in 1960s Britain I recall being taken to new de- developments on a Sunday such as the Preston Bypass, now the M6, Manchester Airport and Birmingham's Bullring. Later I recall seeing the development of Telford Newtown and other new towns across the UK. And now I feel like they symbolise of all that went wrong in planning and development in the UK in the 1960s. I cannot help but feel that Pick, for all its marketing hype and premium prices, will in 20 years' time be seen as a huge eyesore. Its wealthy Chinese residents having moved on to newer developments are leaving the problems created within as yet another set of issues for Jakarta's city's administration. I might also add that I recall being stuck in huge traffic jams every bank holiday on the A5 going to Wales. I so looked forward to these days out as a child. So surely my criticism is a product of my age.